God's image um, from Genesis, the having the image of God and having that responsibility, not from a, a waiting standpoint, but just knowing that I have someone that counts on me, um, my children and my wife, that's an awesome responsibility. Um, and it has shaped every decision that I've made here on earth outside of my salvation, my life is centered around that that responsibility as a father, a husband to my wife, and a father to my son and daughter, the highest calling. That's what's up. Being the father. Same question, Brother Coleman. How has fatherhood changed your life? Fatherhood has changed my life. Ah, thank you. Uh, I thought about that real quick, but I really wasn't expecting that question. Um, fatherhood has changed my life in this way. I remember growing up in the home and there was not a father there. And my mom would sometimes sit us down and just kind of talk to us as we was moving throughout the day. And I would ask her, I said, Mom, I said, uh, what, what, what did my daddy look like? And she would always say, look in the mirror. So I guess she was trying to tell me that it looks like my father. And I never really understood why he did what he did. But um, I learned some things later on in life after I started to search for him. And that brings me to this. I made it up in my mind, I don't have no resentment against my father, but I made it up in my mind that if I had children, Amen. I was never Amen. abandoned them. Yeah. Now, there's no disrespect to what my father. I learned later that I don't think my father was the best thing to do. I know your father and your mother too live long from the earth. So I want to live long from the earth. So I said to myself, I said, I got home. So I like Trump, man, then I just said to myself, okay, we're going to leave that one Okay. I just made it from my mind that I would not abandon my children. And that's, what, that's kind of what I'm today. Amen. Good. 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 Uh, fatherhood, not having a father in the home, I, uh, when I started having children, my oldest boy is 26, he's a police officer now, Amen. but I really wanted to make sure that I was in his life, in every, every area of his life, Amen. but not having a father growing up, there were different people in my life that was father-like. Like Brother Ryan and his brother Kenny, my grandfather, my uncle, mm -hmm. that planted seeds every time that I came within five feet of it. So being a father was not only being a father to my son, but also being a father to those in the community that didn't have fathers, so they could have someone to look up to mm -hmm. and someone that they could come to because they had questions that their mothers could not answer. Because, you know, and my mother raised me, and I, I would say a good man, but she had help because she's not a man. Right. So as a right. man, it was important to me because there was people like the Hobby Lobby would pick us up every Sunday and take us to church. I had to make sure that I was in a position where I can give back just like that as a father, not only to my children, but to other children, not trying to be their father or replace their father, but be that father figure. Brother Kim, same question. How has fatherhood changed your life? Uh, fatherhood has changed my life because it, it helped me to become less uh, self centered. Uh, because Hopefully, hopefully my wife has this testimony. <laughs> I hope. Uh, but there's, there's really nothing I won't do for my family. Uh, there are certain things that we learned over the years because of the lack of a father being close by. Not that he wasn't there, but he wasn't close by me. And, you know, for a 10 year period, we hardly spoke at all. <laughs> Not by design, he just wasn't near. And uh, 
the Lord blessed me to have a pastor at that time that I could go to as a father and talk to and get some insight as to how he treated his kids or how he brought up his kids. And uh, so I, I tried my best to make sure, because the Bible says, uh, man don't take care of his family. Right. He shouldn't even right. eat. He shouldn't even eat. And I, I took that scripture to heart when I took to my family. So some of the days where I am going to work, there have been days where I get up and say, I'm not going today. And I look at my son and my wife and I say, you know, I got to go. Right. Right. And, uh, so those, those are the kind of things that have changed my life. When I was a young man, you know, I might go, I might not. But as I got older, I understood the responsibilities that were involved in taking care of family. So I got out. I did what I had to do. Amen. Good. Amen. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen, for the answers. Our next question will be posed to the sons on the panel. Mark King Jr., can you speak on a time or event when your father's guidance or directions got you out of a tight spot? Well, um, Well, for me, um, probably through probably for high probably through high school, um, there was a time where it didn't look like I was going to graduate. And since I was a since I was a really young kid, my dad had been really tough on me about my grades. So whenever my grades had slipped, he 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 get on me really hard. But my senior year, uh, I did some things I wasn't supposed to, so I ended up failing a couple classes. But my dad, he was patient. He was a lot more patient with me this time, and he was able to help. That patience that he showed was able to help me to uh, be able to fix myself and uh, graduate. Yeah. Justin, so mine would be um, through elementary and through middle school. My, my problem wasn't the grades, my problem was behavior. So every week or every other week I would be in trouble talking or something. My dad would stay on me. But uh, I say that helped me, even that it helps me now. Through high school, even though I had more freedom, it helps me be physical than high school. So the impact of a father is very important, we just said. Examples of discipline and how to carry yourself, how to exemplify patience during times of, uh, of difficulty, understanding. So tell me, gentlemen, give me, uh, same young, two young men, give me uh, a couple words that you would use to describe your father, Brother Ken. Uh, I just have one word, and that probably would be strong, because us as a family, we've been through a lot. There have been times when we've been struggling, even though they wouldn't tell me that we were struggling. <laughs> 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 see, see how strong my dad was, uh, how calm he would stay, uh, always be me. Thank you, sir. Brother Justin. I have two words. Focus and hard work. My dad is always hard working. He's going to work hard until the boys focus on Focus and hard work. So that, once again, those are great qualities that fathers need to exemplify because you know, we know that they're, that they're watching. We know the children are watching. And we've got to put out, uh, we've got to set that, that good example. All right, the next question is for uh, Brother Bobby Samuels. In the movie, the character Derek Williams seemed to have a chip on his shoulder concerning his father not being in his life being raised by your mother. Can you speak to that dynamic? Yes, sir. Well, in the community that I grew up in, there were no fathers. So it was pretty much the norm. So there was no shift. Um, at times, there were some resentment because I had to work at a young age to help out my mother. Uh, if it was if it was someone trash or 
cutting some yard, selling freeze cups or Amen. whatever it is we had to do to, to make the ends meet. We, we did it because my mom worked two jobs and went to school so she could better herself and help us out. So at a young age, we learned how to cook. At five years old, push the chair up to the stove, scramble some eggs, you know, washing dishes. But resentment, I don't believe it was there because I had people in my house. I mean, were in my life, like my grandpa, my uncle, Brother Riley. Brother Riley was such a, a instrument. He did, I don't even think he, well, he does because I told him. Because he was our life. He was playing football. He was going to school, making good grades. He was the he was the neighborhood hero. Mm -hmm. Honestly, mm -hmm. going to college. Nobody else is going to college. Then we get to see him on TV. So that was our life. Now my father, when I did find him, and I know some of you all know that story yes. because I found him quite a few years later, and he was an alcoholic. But Jesus allowed him the opportunity to get to know him before he passed. So growing in Jesus gave me the opportunity to go out and reach him. And when I did reach out to him, he rejected me. I would go to his house and cuss me out, cuss my family out, my kids out, put us out, put us out of his house. But because of who God allowed me to be through Christ, I just kept going back. I just kept loving on him. I kept trying to be that example, and finally, with Jesus' love, he came in. And I believe by him coming in made me a better person. Because it, it, it taught me that I had to love them where they was at until they need to get where they need to be. So that, I don't think there was any res resentment, resentment, you know what I mean? Because it was the known for our community. No one had a father there. You know, so this is what this is where we were. Uh, Brother Coleman, from your experience, can you address some of the sacrifices a father may have to make? Sacrifice, uh, sacrifices, uh, it's a tremendous word, I think. Um, but it's fitting. Uh, when you start to talk about sacrifice, something has to die. Mm -hmm. Nothing wants to die. I don't want to die. Mm -hmm. But sacrifice, it's, it's a tremendous word. Um, the Lord didn't save me, or I didn't allow the Lord to save me until I was 28. And um, I didn't know what sacrifice was until the Lord saved me uh, to 28, yeah, basically whatever you wanted to do. And when the Lord delivered me, I learned a sense of sacrifice, but I didn't understand the fullness of it. The only time I really understood the fullness of sacrifice is after I had left church for five years and suffered a while and then came back. On this end, I understand it's not just sacrifice, it's a willing sacrifice. I don't mind uh, being sacrificed now because I understand what it means not just to sacrifice but to be a willing sacrifice. I don't mind getting up in the morning. I don't mind my son or my daughter calling me at any time of the day or night. Amen. It does not matter what they want. They know. Papa and I like, look, you look bad, man. He got you. It doesn't matter what it is. And I have to be careful because it'll almost be to a fault. So with that said, I'd much rather look at it as being a living sacrifice. Because it, 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 it doesn't matter. Now, certain things just don't matter. But my kids, my wife, any of you, I ain't got nothing. But if I got it, you can have it. I don't mind sacrifice. I don't mind giving up. I don't mind giving up the time. I don't mind even giving up the money. I don't mind giving up information. If I have something that's good, you can have it. You know why? Because I'm looking for that land that you talking about. Brother House, um, considering 
what fatherhood means to you and your children. Can you give us some of the things that you admire or appreciate in your children? Can I ask both those questions? You sure. Real quick. I'll try to be quick because I don't want to pass the sacrifice one up because <clears throat> that's a that's a big word and I believe I believe the sacrifice begins at, at conception um, because the what the society what we are facing in society is a credit to fatherlessness and many fathers are absent. Um, I mean, they can work behind the scenes, if you know what I mean. We have other kids in the audience. They can work behind the scenes, but when the curtain is drawn and it's great time to step up to the plate, they're absent. And uh, that's why so many kids are coming to this world but, and don't know who their father is or the father's not there. Because uh, being a father is a big, big man's world. That's what we step up to the plate and take the responsibility. That's where the, the sacrifice begins. So with me, my goals and my ambitions in life shifted once conception took place. And I didn't run from my wife. Or and I can say my wife because I say because we have to speak where we are as a church and as a society. Um, I can be responsible with my with my Tools, if you will, but then when conception happens and the baby comes, I can't treat her like she, I don't know you or I don't want to show up. I thank God for that conversation because the sacrifice starts there. As a man, as a protector, as a provider, as a as a giver, that's when the big giving starts at conception. What was the other question? <laughs> If you could name some qualities or characteristics you appreciate in your children. Yes. Um, this is what I try to to give my kids and, and I tell them, uh, even even in, in what 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 God has allowed me to experience in my life, even in the work that I do as a, as a police officer, I, don't, I I try not to take every day for granted. Um, and I, I thank God that I've been able to be with him through elementary school before. All the way from the crib to pre care, daycare, elementary school, fifth, sixth, twelve, all the way up to now. I don't want to ever take for granted my responsibility. And I'm so thankful to God because of what He poured in me, because of my foundation, you know, my mom, and like Brother Baba said, it's not with just my mom, my dad, those men in my life that I was able to see and to gravitate towards that man that I did not have before me in my home as an example, but through what God provided for me in my church and who I allow, who my mom and my peers allow me to be around to gather the pieces to become the man that I am today. I thank God that they have a foundation and they love God. And what I try to instill in them, what I'm thankful in them, that they have a sense of God awareness. That they don't want to disappoint God. And that they fear God. So I thank God for their appetite in their lives. <clears throat> I was thinking about Justin this morning. Um, and I think, you know, they used to harp me to play my music all the time. You know, I, I got a 40, 4,600 songs on my phone and they worship. But now it's Justin blasting the music in the house. You know, uh, worship. He's a worshiper, you know. Christina, she's a worshiper, and I, and I, you know, it's just it's a little simple. That I remember, Christine, you know, I could always look at her, and then the worship service, just that simple right there. Y'all see? Just that they have worship in their teens, and I'm so thankful for, for that, and I'm taking for granted. Y'all look, you alive. Yeah. Brother Coleman, same question. What uh, characteristics, qualities do you appreciate in your children? Just the fact that they've grown up, they're adults. Janet is 40. Derek is 37. Oh, 
folks now. Um, oh, y'all remember that, do I remember, and they had to drag that boy down the stairs. That's a whole story. Um, one of the qualities in my children that I really admire, and I'm going to a little bit, um, they have grown up at this point, they are on their way back. And I have no doubt.
how he can get into the word of God and really pull out something. Sometimes we're just talking and he'll come up with something and I'm like, I just, wow, you know, get up, get up. I don't say that in front of him, so I need to say it more. <laughs> to let him know. Sometimes when he gets in the word of God, he'll, we're just having a conversation. You know, we're talking about sports or something, we're talking about whatever, he can pull out some things. You know, so I, I really appreciate that. Amen. 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 All right, so as we uh, start to draw the panel to a close, um, the movie that I mentioned, The Climb, uh, the main character's name is Derek Williams. Uh, he grows up without a father. And this is spoiler alert, so, but please still go back. He grows up without a father, and in the attacks him through pride. And he becomes a very successful mountain climber, or ex-athlete. And every time he climbs a mountain or reaches a goal, he pulls out this picture of his father. Because his father would leave the motel room when he was very young. So he pulls out this picture of his father. He holds it up to the sky and he screams at the picture. Look at me, Pop. I did it without you. I didn't need you. I didn't need you. the course of the movie, his pride is broken, especially after the young lady whose father is saved, the young lady is saved, the other lady is saved, the young lady is pregnant, he runs from his responsibility. He doesn't handle that well at all. And he goes and climbs this mountain with, a, with the other young man who is saved. The young man is white. Derek is black. And uh, they're on top of the mountain. They're coming down. And there's an avalanche, and uh, the saved brother hooks into Derek's lanyard that's attached to his body and pushes him off the edge of the mountain and throws himself into the avalanche as an anchor. He, he uses himself as an anchor to save this other brother's life. Mm. which allows Derek to be able to get down the mountain, and, he, and, and even getting down the mountain the rest of the way, he had to break his pride because there's some things he had to do that he never wanted to do, but he had to give in. But the last night of Sharon, before they reached the mountaintop and the young man sacrificed his life, he told Derek, you need to go to God. You need to take that to God. That anger that you had, the pride that, you, that you're feeling, you need to take that to God. I'm not going to spoil the rest of the movie. I'm going to say something for you to look forward to. But please watch the movie. The last question involves a scene where after he gets down from the mountain, time passes by, he repents, but he goes to the door of the young lady's father. And you know father's hot as fish cakes. Got my baby girl pregnant, ran from your responsibilities, now you're standing here looking at me, what you want me to say? So that was even a challenge for the father. As a father of a daughter, and you're put in place in that position, oh man, it takes some Jesus to hold back. From just not unleashing or unleashing. Um, but the young man comes to the father and he says, I'm not even hurt. And the father leads him to salvation. So, gentlemen, putting yourself in the place of the father in that movie, how do you address issues when you see your children going off the path, Brother King? Uh, one, of, one of the ways, uh, Mark is, uh, what are you, 6'5 now? Big guy. Uh, I'm 57, I, I can't fight. <laughs> Not like that. Uh, but one of the things you have to do is you you have to let them go so that they will come to a knowledge of some things. Sometimes it's, you don't want to do that. No, no father, no mother wants to let their child go out and get hurt or get whatever. No, I don't. I don't know of any. Uh, if they, I'm sure they don't go to this church if there's any. But a lot of times you you're trying to protect them. You're trying to keep them. Sometimes the best way to protect them is to let them go. 
so that the Lord can bring them to a knowledge. All right now, all right. Uh, all right. But it is, you know, the, the child and the prodigal son, when the son ran away, the father basically considered it dead. Mm -hmm. Not easy, but he had to come to himself. And when he came to himself, he got up, turned around, and went back to his father. And the father saw him afar off and ran out to meet him. And so what I'm saying is sometimes you have to let them make the mistake. You know, God sometimes lets us make mistakes in order to get our attention. Sometimes you have to do that. Uh, you know, I, I see a lot of young women here today sometimes. Young ladies need to make, uh, sometimes make mistakes. Men make mistakes. But sometimes the mistakes are hidden by men. And the women's mistakes are seen out front, if you get my meaning. But a lot of times, we as a people forget that the mistakes that they made are just like the mistakes that, they, that the men made, but you have to hold everybody in the love of God. You have to hold them in, God can forgive, God can forgive, God can forgive. Because if truth be told, some of us, you know, some such for some of us, I say that, such for some of us, we had thoughts that I didn't get caught. I didn't get in this trouble and I didn't get in that trouble. But guess what? If your father didn't catch you, if your mother didn't catch you, God still caught you. God still saw it. And now you have to come to God and God is willing to repent, uh, uh, to forgive all that you've done. So sometimes we have to learn how to forgive. You know, we can't hold... I, I can't hold my son to my standard, if you get what I'm saying. I, I'm not saying holiness or nothing. I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about I had some ideas that I thought were here when I found out they were down here. You know what I'm saying? And, and as, I, as I learned through the Word, through prayer, through fasting, I learned that some of the stuff that I was trying to hold to, I couldn't even hold to. So sometimes we, we have to understand the love of God and we have to understand, hey, I know you made a mistake, but God is still God. He still loves you. He still wants to forgive you. All you have to do is come to Him. Because I can't save you anyway. All right, I can't do it. It has to be God that does the save. And that's for everybody. God is the one that does the save. The church preaches, the church teaches, the church draws, the church does all this stuff. We baptize, we do all of that, but guess what? It still takes God right. to say it. Right. It still takes God. Brother Bobby, can you add to that? Yes, sir. Um, I have taught my kids since birth, and I got a speech to make a part of this cycle. It's called Choices. It's called Choices. And uh, if you choose to have faith, and I tell you, faith is knowing that God is right here. Faith is knowing that God is here. So if God is here, He sees everything that you do. Amen. He really sees it, and I, I instill it in Him, in them, that you know, at any moment, He can come back. Don't get caught with your pants down. All right. Literally, don't get caught. You know, uh, my 26-year-old, uh, he says, says he's a virgin. And I praise God for that. I praise God for that because He understands the how important it is to save himself for marriage. How important it is for Him to save Himself for Jesus. Don't get caught. He knows that as a father I've instilled in, in all of my children that you have to be aware that God can see it if you don't think nobody else sees it. You have to know that. You have to know that even if you do make a mistake, mistake, be quick to repent. Be quick to repent and repent and turn and don't go back to it. And I've been still that in them and, and we have family meetings all the time and that's one of the first things I go, hey, have you repented today? You have to be right. 
there is no choice. You, you have no choice. You have to be right. Same question. Mild hurt when they go contrary to what we know is right. Then a sense of anger. And my wife and I, we have adopted a phrase, a phrase or adopted a, a sense of understanding. We have taken ours. and tied them to the altar. Because a, a lot of times, we'll mess it up. That's, that's good. That's but I know if he and she is tied to the altar, there's sacrifices. God's going to deal with it. And he can do a lot better job than I can. Just tie to the altar and keep praying. Brother House? What was the question? Putting yourself in the place of the father in that movie when the young man came after his daughter was pregnant. Uh, how do you address issues in your, child, in your children's life when you see them going off the path? He'll never let you down. I was thinking of that old song that she started playing with. Because I, I remember my, my relationship with my kids my relationship with God. Oh, God is my, my father. And he's never left me. He's never forsaken me. He's never taken a step back from me. All the conditions that cause separation in my relationship with my father has been a choice of mine. And I try to, as a father, keep that relationship keep that connection with my kids. Um, I think that's the best way that I can reach out to them or the best source of advice I can give to them. It starts from day one building that relationship uh, with them to, I can say, do as I've done or do as I do when I follow because I have let them know my mistakes. I've been transparent to them that I'm not perfect. They're not going to be perfect. This life is not perfect, but as a father, as I turn to God, He can always turn to me. As a natural father, He's never left me, He's never forsaken me. He's never broken that relationship. So I say, is this our last comment? So I'm going to put my last two cents in. Is this the last question? So I say, I say to every daughter, every son in this congregation, I love you because I see the kingdom focus as a father, not just my son, who I can reach out and hug and touch right here. But he's a young man that I can reach and touch. And say I love you. That's the kingdom focus that brought about this here. So it's not about me and my house. As long as we good. As long as we because first lady of uh, grace, Mother Boyd, when I was thinking about her daughter, on Saturday, she used to come pick us up, take us to the park, spend time, build relationships. I didn't deal with her. She didn't have a responsibility for her. Young men, when I was this age, came pick us up, take us to play basketball. That's good in a relationship. Let's take the time to care about somebody that's not yours. But ultimately, when we understand the kingdom focus, that's why I vow to spend time with you, to build relationships, and to be in the brokenness, not of my home, but of our home. And then we have the kingdom focus as fathers. That's what we have to do. We have to be in the relationship. Amen. Let's uh, give God praise on that. I'd like to thank all of you gentlemen for your participation, yeah. for your candid honesty, and uh, a lot of pearls of wisdom were dropped today. I hope everybody had their glove on and caught a few of them. Uh, I give God praise for the ram and the bush in all of our lives. Uh, hearing some of these stories are very, very, very similar to some of my experiences, and, and I know without that ram and the bush that uh, kept me out of uh, taking wrong paths 
that's very important, especially these days when the family is under attack. Satan has got a full court press on marriage, he's got a full court press on families. He doesn't want husbands to be with wives. He wants, he wants the wife or, or to be alone because she's not designed to wear two hats. She's only got one head. So that's why father's necessary in the home. And unfortunately in our community, women have been forced through the attack of the enemy to do the job that they weren't designed to do. Ladies, I'd like to salute you. I thank you. Those of you who have done that job.
until you come to this place. And I simply wanted to just speak uh, very shortly from that subject of as a father carries his son. I'm not going to unpack all of Deuteronomy, but we understand that Moses is here and he's speaking as the book of Deuteronomy just in its title. That word Deuteronomy means the second giving, as we know of the first law. And Moses here is rehearsing uh, to another generation, to a new generation of Israelites, the old law that was spoken to their fathers, uh, even as they came out of the land of Egypt. And there are many reasons why Moses is necessary for him to rehearse as it is for us as parents to rehearse the law of God to the next generation. We understand that uh, this generation is a different generation other than Joshua and Caleb. Everybody in the previous generation has died off and so it has become necessary for somebody to take the responsibility of reminding the next generation of our past. And that, that's what we heard this morning as the fathers began to share and much of which some of us never knew about the brothers. We didn't know because we hadn't had the opportunity or hadn't taken the time to sit down and to share with one another. But in, but in Moses' sharing with the people of God, he begins to remind the younger generation of all the way that God had taken the people of God. Per adventure possibly that their parents had set them down at the table and told them about, amen, the night of the Passover when they had to take that lamb at a moment's notice and get out of town. But the way that God had provided, delivered for them, they, they may not have heard that, Sister Deborah. They may not have heard that when they got into the wilderness and their back was against the wall and the Red Sea was in front of them and their past and the enemy was behind them trying to enslave them still, that when they looked to God, that God provided deliverance for them. They, they, didn't, they didn't know that. They may not have known that for 40 years walking through the wilderness, that when they came into situations, you know how it is, that most of the time people call daddy uh, when trouble hits. I know they say we call mama and mama nurtures us, but many times when things are broken, when we don't see our way and we can't understand, oftentimes we want to call daddy and get some insight uh, because daddy is a protector, he's a provider. Uh, and because of this, Moses saw it necessary to remind uh, the new, this new generation, the next generation of the faithfulness of our father. That's what I want us to understand here this morning because I realize that everybody uh, in this time of celebration, uh, there is still some somberness because all of our fathers weren't like all the brothers that were up here. Some of us are very uh, familiar uh, with the stories that we've heard this morning of uh, fathers that were not there and fathers that abandoned or fathers that may not have been uh, the ideal example for another generation. But the testimony to the faithfulness of our Heavenly Father is that even when your mother and your father forsake you, then the Lord will take you up. And we can see, we can see, we can hear the testimonies, amen, that are right in our midst this morning. I, I can remember, and I'm, I'm coming to a close even now, but I can remember uh, as a young boy, I haven't always been this tall, y'all, but as a young boy, I can remember going fishing with my father, and uh, my older brother was a little taller than me at the time, and when we would go, oftentimes, uh, we would go to the fishing hole, that's, you know, that's the country terminology, we would go uh, to the fishing hole, and the fishing hole, we had to walk to get there, and many times as we would take the journey there, we would be going through tall weeds, and so I can, I can remember it so vividly even now, how my father, as that symbol of strength, he would take all the fishing equipment, the bucket and everything, Brother Coleman, he would take it in one hand, and with the other hand he would grab me by one arm and throw me over his shoulder, and he would walk through the weeds and get us to that spot so we could enjoy where we were. And when I begin to think about that, I can think about how our Heavenly Father has through the years, I heard the brother sing the song this morning, through the years, how our Heavenly Father has picked us up in tough situations. Not just to the Father, to the mothers, but to all of us. It has been God that we have been able to look to and to call upon, amen, that has picked us up and set our feet, amen, in a solid place, on a solid foundation today. And we 
celebrate God, as we celebrate the men, amen, that he's allowed to be in our lives, we celebrate God most of all, amen, for being that faithful father, that father that is always there, even when you couldn't get to your, your earthly father, whether for whatever reason they were not there or not able to be there, whether because of death or situations or circumstances, amen, we were all and to receive that security and to receive that elevation from our situations because of the strength of our Father. This morning, this morning, I want to encourage all of us to understand that He is there. Your Heavenly Father is right there. And as a father carries his children, as a father carries his son in difficult situations, as a father carries his son or his daughter, in times of confusion and misunderstanding, as a father steps in to provide and to protect, so does our Heavenly Father. Amen. Even as he's brought us to this point, yeah. I can hear Mother Whiteside right now. She sang the song. She said, he's able to carry you through no matter what the world may be. Try Jesus, for he satisfies. He's able, amen, just to hear your cry. Trust him in everything you do, for he'll open doors for you, for I Everything they have been and everything they have 